Brought to you by Wikivide Documentaries. Carmen. Carmen is an opera in four acts by French composer Georges Bizet. The libretto was written by Henri Mailhac and Ludovic Olévy, based on a novella of the same title by Prosper Mary May. The opera was first performed at the Opéra Comique in Paris on 3 March 1875, where its breaking of conventions shocked and scandalized its first audiences. Bizet died suddenly after the 33rd performance, unaware that the work would achieve international acclaim within the following ten years. Carmen has since become one of the most popular and frequently performed operas in the classical canon. The Habanera, from Act One and the Toreador Song, from Act Two are among the best known of all operatic arias. The opera is written in the genre of opera comique with musical numbers separated by dialogue. It is set in southern Spain and tells the story of the downfall of Don Jose, a naive soldier who is seduced by the wiles of the fiery gypsy Carmen. Jose abandons his childhood sweetheart in deserts from his military duties, yet loses Carmen's love to the glamorous matador Escamillo, after which Jose kills her in a jealous rage. The depictions of proletarian life, immorality, and lawlessness, and the tragic death of the main character on stage broke new ground in French opera and were highly controversial. After the premiere, most reviews were critical, and the French public was generally indifferent. Carmen initially gained its reputation through a series of productions outside France, and was not revived in Paris until 1883. Thereafter, it rapidly acquired popularity at home and abroad. Later commentators have asserted that Carmen forms the bridge between the tradition of opera comique and the realism or verismo that characterized late 19th century Italian opera. The music of Carmen has since been widely acclaimed for brilliance of melody, harmony, atmosphere, and orchestration, and for the skill with which Bizet musically represented the emotions and suffering of his characters. After the composer's death, the score was subject to significant amendment, including the introduction of recitative in place of the original dialogue. There is no standard edition of the opera, and different views exist as to what versions best express Bizet's intentions. The opera has been recorded many times since the first acoustical recording in 1908, and the story has been the subject of many screen and stage adaptations. Background In the Paris of the 1860s, Despite being a prix de Rome laureate, Bizet struggled to get his stage works performed. The capital's two main state-funded opera houses, the Opéra and the Opéra Comique, followed conservative repertoires that restricted opportunities for young native talent. Bizet's professional relationship with Leon Carvalho, manager of the independent Théâtre Lyrique Company, enabled him to bring to the stage two full-scale operas, Les Pêcheurs de Pearl and La Yoli Fille de Perth but neither enjoyed much public success. When artistic life in Paris resumed after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, Bizet found wider opportunities for the performance of his works. His one-act opera Jamile opened at the Opéra Comique in May 1872. Although this failed and was withdrawn after 11 performances, it led to a further commission from the theatre, this time for a full-length opera for which Henri Mailhac and Ludovic Olévy would provide the libretto. Olévy who had written the text for Bizet's student opera Le Docteur Miracle, was a cousin of Bizet's wife, Genevieve. He and Mailhac had a solid reputation as the librettists of many of Jacques Offenbach's operettas. Bizet was delighted with the opera comique commission, and expressed to his friend Edmund Glabert his satisfaction in the absolute certainty of having found my path. The subject of the projected work was a matter of discussion between composer, librettists and the opera comique management. Adolf de Leuven, on behalf of the theatre, made several suggestions that were politely rejected. It was Bizet who first proposed an adaptation of Prosper Marami's novella Carmen. Marami's story is a blend of travelogue and adventure yarn, possibly inspired by the writer's lengthy travels in Spain in 1830, and had originally been published in 1845 in the journal Revue des Deux Mondes. It may have been influenced in part by Alexander Pushkin's 1824 poem. The Gypsies, a work Mary May had translated into French. It has also been suggested that the story was developed from an incident told to Mary May by his friend the Countess Montijo. Bizet may first have encountered the story during his Rome sojourn of 1858-60. Since his journals record Mary May as one of the writers whose works he absorbed in those years. 
Act 1. A square, in Seville. On the right, a door to the tobacco factory. At the back, a bridge. On the left, a guardhouse. A group of soldiers relax in the square, waiting for the changing of the guard and commenting on the passers-by. Michaela appears, seeking Jose. Morales tells her that, Jose is not yet on duty, and invites her to wait with them. She declines, saying she will return later. Jose arrives, with the new guard, who is greeted and imitated by a crowd of urchins. As the factory bell rings, the cigarette girls emerge and exchange banter, with young men in the crowd. Carmen enters and sings a provocative habanera on the untamable nature of love. The men plead with her, to choose a lover, and after some teasing she throws a flower to Don Jose, who thus far has been ignoring her, but is now annoyed by her insolence. As the women go back to the factory, Michaela returns and gives Jose a letter and a kiss from his mother. He reads that his mother wants him, to return home and marry Michaela, who retreats in shy embarrassment on learning this. Just as Jose declares that he is ready, to heed his mother's wishes, the women stream from the factory in great agitation. Zaniga, the officer of the guard, learns that Carmen has attacked a woman with a knife. When challenged, Carmen answers with mocking defiance. Zaniga orders Jose to tie her hands while he prepares the prison warrant. Left alone with Jose, Carmen beguiles him with a segadilla, in which she sings of a night of dancing and passion with her lover, whoever that may be, in Lila's Pastures Tavern. Confused yet mesmerized, Jose agrees to free her hands. As she is led away she pushes her escort to the ground and runs off laughing. Jose is arrested, for dereliction of duty. Act 2 Lilla's pastures in two months have passed. Carmen and her friends Frasquito and Mercedes are entertaining Zaniga and other officers in Pastures Inn. Carmen is delighted to learn of Jose's release from two months' detention. Outside, a chorus and procession announces the arrival of the Toreador as Camillo. Invited inside, he introduces himself with a Toreador song and sets his sights on Carmen, who brushes him aside. Lilla's pastia hustles the crowds and the soldiers away. When only Carmen, Frasquita, and Mercedes remain, the smugglers Danker and Remendado arrive and reveal their plans to dispose of some recently acquired contraband. Frasquita and Mercedes are keen to help them, but Carmen refuses, since she wishes to wait for Jose. After the smugglers leave, Jose arrives. Carmen treats him to a private exotic dance, but her song is joined by a distant bugle call from the barracks. When Jose says he must return to duty, she mocks him, and he answers by showing her the flower that she threw to him in the square. Unconvinced, Carmen demands he show his love by leaving with her. Jose refuses to desert, but as he prepares to depart, Zaniga enters looking for Carmen. He and Jose fight, and are separated by the returning smugglers, who restrain Zaniga. Having attacked a superior officer, Jose now has no choice but to join Carmen and the smugglers. Act 3 A wild spot in the mountains Carmen and Jose enter with the smugglers and their booty. Carmen has now become bored with Jose, and tells him scornfully that he should go back to his mother. Frasquito and Mercedes amuse themselves by reading their fortunes from the cards. Carmen joins them and finds that the cards are foretelling her death, and Jose's. The women depart to suborn the customs officers who are watching the locality. Jose is placed on guard duty. Michaela enters with a guide, seeking Jose, and determined to rescue him from Carmen. On hearing a gunshot she hides in fear. It is Jose, who is fired at an intruder who proves to be S. Camillo. Jose's pleasure at meeting the bullfighter turns to anger when S. Camillo declares his infatuation with Carmen. The pair fight but are interrupted by the returning smugglers and girls. As S. Camillo leaves he invites everyone to his next bullfight in Seville, Michaela is discovered. At first, Jose will not leave with her despite Carmen's mockery, but he agrees to go when told that his mother is dying. As he departs, vowing he will return, S. Camillo is heard in the distance, singing the Doriador's song. Act 4 A square in Seville. At the back, the walls of an ancient amphitheater's Niga, Frasquita, and Mercedes are among the crowd awaiting the arrival of the bullfighters. East Camillo enters with Carmen, 
and they express their mutual love. As Escamillo goes into the arena, Frasquito and Mercedes warn Carmen that Jose is nearby, but Carmen is unafraid and willing to speak to him. Alone, she is confronted by the desperate Jose. While he pleads vainly for her to return to him, cheers are heard from the arena. As Jose makes his last entreaty, Carmen contemptuously throws down the ring he gave her and attempts to enter the arena. He then stabs her, and as Escamillo is acclaimed by the crowds, Carmen dies. Jose kneels and sings, Ah, Carmen. Ma Carmen adore As the crowd exits the arena, Jose confesses to killing the woman he loved. Writing History Mailhack and Olave were a long-standing duo with an established division of labor. Mailhack, who was completely unmusical, wrote the dialogue, and Olave the verses. There is no clear indication of when work began on Carmen. Bizet and the two librettists were all in Paris during 1873, and easily able to meet. Thus there is little written record or correspondence relating to the beginning of the collaboration. The libretto was prepared in accordance with the conventions of opera comique, with dialogue separating musical numbers. It deviates from Marani's novella in a number of significant respects. In the original, events are spread over a much longer period of time, and much of the main story is narrated by Jose from his prison cell. As he awaits execution for Carmen's murder, Michaela does not feature in Marami's version. And the Escamillo character is peripheral, a picador named Lucas who is only briefly Carmen's grand passion. Carmen has a husband called Garcia, whom Jose kills during a quarrel. In the novella, Carmen and Jose are presented much less sympathetically than they are in the opera, but its biographer Mina Curtis comments that Marami's Carmen, on stage, would have seemed an unmitigated and unconvincing monster, had her character not been simplified and deepened. With rehearsals due to begin in October 1873, Bizet began composing in or around January of that year, and by the summer had completing the music for the first act and perhaps sketched more. At that point, according to Bizet's biographer Winton Dean, some hitch at the opera comic intervened, and the project was suspended for a while. One reason for the delay may have been the difficulties in finding a singer for the title role. Another was a split that developed between the joint directors of the theatre, Camille du Local and Adolf de Leuven, over the advisability of staging the work. De Leuven had vociferously opposed the entire notion of presenting so risque a story in what he considered a family theatre, and was sure that audiences would be frightened away. He was assured by Olavi that the story would be turned down, that Carmen's character would be softened and offset by Michaela, described by Olavi as a very innocent, very chaste young girl. Furthermore, the gypsies would be presented as comic characters, and Carmen's death would be overshadowed at the end by triumphal processions, ballets, and joyous fanfares. Der Leuven reluctantly agreed, but his continuing hostility towards the project led to his resignation from the theatre early in 1874. After the various delays, Bizet appears to have resumed work on Carmen early in 1874. He completed the draft of the composition, 1,200 pages of music, in the summer, which he spent at the artist's colony at Baugeville, just outside Paris. He was pleased with the result, informing a friend, I have written a work that is all clarity and vivacity, full of color and melody. During the period of rehearsals, which began in October, Bizet repeatedly altered the music, sometimes, at the request of the orchestra who found some of it impossible to perform, sometimes to meet the demands of individual singers, and otherwise in response to the demands of the theatre's management. The vocal score that Bizet published in March 1875 shows significant changes. From the version of the score that he sold to the publishers, Chowdens, in January 1875, the conducting score used at the premiere differs from each of these documents. There is no definitive edition, and there are differences among musicologists about which version represents the composer's true intentions. Bizet also changed the libretto, reordering sequences and imposing his own verses where he felt that the librettists had strayed too far from the character of Marami's original. Among other changes, he provided new words for Carmen's Habanera and rewrote the text of Carmen's solo in the Act 3 card scene. He also provided a new opening line for the Sagadilla in Act 1. Characterization Most of the characters in Carmen, the soldiers, the smugglers, 
the Gypsy Women and the secondary leads Michaela and S. Camillo, are reasonably familiar types within the opera comique tradition, although drawing them from proletarian life was unusual. The two principals, Jose and Carmen, lie outside the genre, while each is presented quite differently, from Marami's portrayals of a murderous brigand and a treacherous, amoral schema, even in their relatively sanitized forms neither corresponds to the norms of opera comique. They are more akin to the Verismo style that would find fuller expression in the works of Puccini. Dean considers that Jose is the central figure of the opera, it is his fate rather than Carmen's that interests us. The music characterizes his gradual decline, act by act, from honest soldier to deserter, vagabond and finally murderer. In Act 1 he is a simple countryman aligned musically with Michaela. In Act 2 he evinces a greater toughness the result of his experiences as a prisoner, but it is clear that by the end of the act his infatuation with Carmen has driven his emotions beyond control. Dean describes him in Act 3 as a trapped animal who refuses to leave his cage even when the door is opened for him, ravaged by a mix of conscience, jealousy and despair. In the final act his music assumes a grimness and purposefulness that reflects his new fatalism. He will make one more appeal. If Carmen refuses, he knows what to do. Carmen herself, says Dean, is a new type of operatic heroine representing a new kind of love, not the innocent kind associated with the spotless soprano school, but something altogether more vital and dangerous. Her capriciousness, fearlessness and love of freedom are all musically represented. She is redeemed from any suspicion of vulgarity by her qualities of courage and fatalism so vividly realized in the music. Curtis suggests that Carmen's character spiritually and musically, may be a realization of the composer's own unconscious longing for a freedom denied to him by his stifling marriage. Harold C. Schoenberg likens Carmen to a female Don Giovanni. She would rather die than be false to herself. The dramatic personality of the character and the range of moods she is required to express call for exceptional acting and singing talents. This has deterred some of opera's most distinguished exponents. Maria Callas, though she recorded the part, never performed it on stage. The musicologist Hugh MacDonald observes that, French opera never produced another femme as fatale as Carmen, though she may have influenced some of Massenet's heroines. MacDonald suggests that outside the French repertoire, Richard Strauss Salome and Alban Berg's Lulu may be seen as distant degenerate descendants of Bizet's temptress. Bizet was reportedly contemptuous of the music that he wrote for S. Camillo. Well, they asked for ordure, and they've got it, he is said to have remarked about the Toreador's song, but, as Dean comments, the triteness lies in the character, not in the music. Michaelis music has been criticized for its gaunodesque elements, although Dean maintains that her music has greater vitality than that of any of Gaunod's own heroines. Assembling the cast the search for a singer-actress to play Carmen began in the summer of 1873. Press speculation favored Sulma Bufar, who was perhaps the librettist's preferred choice. She had sung leading roles in many of Offenbach's operas, but she was unacceptable to Bizet, and was turned down by Dulocal as unsuitable. In September an approach was made to Marie Rose, well known for previous triumphs at the Opera Comique, the Opera and in London. She refused the part when she learned that she would be required to die on stage. The role was then offered to Celestina gallet Marier, who agreed to terms with Du Local after several months' negotiation. gallet Marier, a demanding and at times tempestuous performer, would prove a staunch ally of Bizet, often supporting his resistance to demands from the management that the work should be toned down. At the time it was generally believed that she and the composer were conducting a love affair during the months of rehearsal. The leading tenor part of Don Jose was given to Paul Lurie, a rising star of the opera comique who had recently appeared in works by Massenet and Delibé. He would later become a baritone, and in 1887 sang the role of Zerga in the Covent Garden premiere of Les Pêcheurs de Pearl. Jacques Bouhy, engaged to sing as Camillo, was a young Belgian-born baritone who had already appeared in demanding roles such as Mephiste Orpheles in Gaunod's Faust and as Mozart's Figaro, Marguerite Chapuis who sang Michaela, was at the beginning of a short career in which she was briefly a star at London's Theatre Royal, Drury Lane. The impresario James H. Mapleson thought her, one of the most charming vocalists it has been my pleasure to know.
However, she married and left the stage altogether in 1876, refusing Maple Ison's considerable cash inducements to return. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries. Would you like